What I've noticed in the past with both myself and my clients is that when you come back from times like this, if you've actually continued to train or exercise or whatever you want to call it, but with some consistency, I bet many of those people will come back and set PRs in LP, three sets of five sort of PRs. Then the ones who didn't and just let themselves get really out of shape won't set PRs. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am your host, Matt Reynolds, and I'm here with my good buddy. Rarely do I have somebody on the show that's uh, bigger and more jacked than me, but today, that is not the case. I have Michael Wolf on, the Wolf. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me back on, Matt. It's great to be here. <laughs> not your first time, although it is your first time under quarantine being on the <laughs> show. <laughs> and so really, I wanted to have you on the show because um, you are one of those people, like most many of our listeners, who uh, you've been training at a gym in Austin for the last few years. And now that we're in this sort of lockdown, you are at home in your apartment with your pup chops and you don't have much equipment and you're doing the best you can. And so I wanted to have you on the show today and let's just talk about training at home under kind of suboptimal conditions. Yeah, it's it's a obviously very great, good topic for now. And, uh, you know, the, the good thing about it is you get to set a new quarantine PR every day if you want to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's like uh, home gym LP all over again, and you're just like set a new push ups PR or a new <laughs> a new air squats PR. So, uh, so yeah, you you have been training at this uh, at a public gym. When did they close down? How long have you had to train at home? It's funny because I I had been training for a meet that I uh, was training real hard, and I actually part just bad luck and part my own pushing too hard. I I sustained a couple of not major injuries, but enough that I kind of had to revisit well, whether I was going to do the meet and I decided not to do it. And I took a week and a half off from the gym right before this all happened. So I was coming off and I have not done that in 15 years. Right. Other than, you know, when I had a, you know, I was really sick. Surgery right? or surgery something. Or yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was coming off a week and a half off and then the gym closed, uh, the first week of March, which was, before they were required to, but they just felt they had been implementing stricter cleaning policies and they were even closing midday to do a full gym clean. Uh, and then the day I was going to go back, I think it was like the first Monday in March, like the seventh or something like that. Uh, they decided to close down. Mm. So at that point I already hadn't been to the gym in a week and a half or two and starting back up, had to start back up with what I had at home, which was what, what equipment did you have at home at the time? At the time, I just had two kettlebells, uh, a 16 kilo, which is 35 pounds, and a 24 kilo, which is 53 pounds, which for somebody like myself, who is you know, a 700 deadlifter uh, creeping up on just about a 500 bench, it's not a lot of weight. Not so, a lot of weight. <laughs> you know, it, it was kind of mentally very easy for me to tell myself, oh, it's, it's so light, it's not even worth doing anything. But I also realized that if I did that for an extended period of time, I would just get so out of shape that coming back would be brutal when this was all over. Sure. So uh, I, I definitely want to spend some time talking about the workouts that you've done at your house, but I actually want to back up a little bit before that and talk to people who literally have nothing. I want to start there. The, they're in the most dire situation because I, they don't have any kettlebells. They don't have any dumbbells. They have no equipment whatsoever. Um, you know, the question is, where do you start? If you're that person and you have nothing, what do you start with? That's, that is the hardest question because if, if, we're, if we're strength coaches and we're talking to people who are interested in the pursuit of strength, you can't, you can't optimally load strength with no external resistance, right? True. It just, there's no so intensity. Already, there is no intensity, right? Yeah, so there there is. is no intensity. We're already dealing with a very suboptimal situation. But at the same time, again, if you, if you do absolutely nothing for four or six or eight weeks, however long this lasts, you are going to be in really bad shape when it's all over. Like even if it was just going to be five days, I'd say, don't worry. You'll be, you know, you'll, sure. you'll be fine. Come back. But if it's going to be six weeks, seven weeks, who knows? And you, you know, your air squats and your push ups and stuff like that, they're going to be a lot better than nothing. So the way I think about it for all of these, whether it's no equipment or limited equipment, I still think about how can I best work the same basic movement pattern? So instead of thinking like, 
all I've got is barbell squat, barbell press, barbell deadlift, barbell bench press, and chin up or pull down. I think, what is the movement pattern that's at play there? What is my body doing? And how can I closely mimic that or as close as possible mimic that with no equipment and then a little bit better with limited equipment? So a squat is still a squat, right? That doesn't really require a lot of creativity. Now, I've got some people who have who had, had no equipment and they're holding, they're, st- they're doing some air squats maybe the first day to kind of get into it. And then their, you know, their wife or their kid helps out and they'll, they'll do, um, they're holding their wife or their kid like front hold. Yeah. Um, some of them tried piggyback and they said it didn't work that well, which yep. makes sense. Yep. You know, we've all messed around with that at like the, you know, on a picnic or something and you sure. can all fall over. Uh, but yeah, the people are front holding their wife and their kids to add a little bit of resistance. I mean, we're we pretending that it's a heavy triple. No, but is it better than an air squat? Yeah, probably. Yeah. And is it slowing down detraining? Probably, probably for sure. And so most people, even those who don't have any equipment at all, I have, first off, do you have a handful of clients like this that you're training right now with Barbell Logic who don't have really hardly any equipment at home? Uh, I've got one or two, yeah. So I, I have maybe six. And, um, you know, it's been interesting to see what they use. So I've got clients that are using 50-pound bags of dog food. I've got clients who have uh, used like the five-gallon Culligan water containers, which is like a giant kettlebell because it's got a handle in the middle. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, you got to really do the splits. It's a big time uh, sumo kettlebell swing if you're going to do something like that. But, uh, you know, you can find things that are heavy. We've, I've got a client who found um, some big rocks, like the Midwestern guy, and, you know, like found some, you know, big heavy stuff. Tires. I was going to uh, say, yeah, spare tire. Spare tire works really well. Like any of those things you can find that's just heavy, right? Anvils or stuff out in the shop. Uh, those things tend to work really well. So even without equipment, and remember, this is how people, quote unquote, trained before 100 years ago, you know, like for all of human history, up until maybe the early 1800s, when they started to invent these things, then uh, that's, that's what they use. They just use like the normal stuff they could get their hands on. So it, it's working okay. And like you said, it's not, there's no way to continue to incrementally load the weight. That's the hard thing. Um, but you can certainly continue to work the muscle groups in the full range of motion as best you can using the same sort of standards that we've always used. And because intensity really isn't the, it isn't one of the things that we can change. It isn't one of the variables that we can change. We can just continue to, to sort of LP with volume with, with more reps or more sets, you know, more total work or even things like density, more work in a, in an amount of time are all things that, that have worked pretty well. I haven't gotten to, to anybody where I'm playing with density yet, but what I, one thing I have done with a lot of them who have either no equipment or they're using something improvised, like they're holding their kid or, you know, a tire or whatever. Um, I've used tempo with them. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you take that, you know, you've got a, a 10 gallon jug and you know, it's, it's better than nothing, but it's still only weigh. you know, what does that weigh? 80 pounds. pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whatever it weighs. It's not, it's not heavy for a guy who squats 300 or, sure. or whatever. But you make that squat descent five seconds, and then you know what? A set of eight isn't that easy. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, I've used. Uh, I certainly I have clients that have pull up bars, chin up bars in their doorways, but a lot of them don't, and they're doing uh, inverted pull ups like on the edge of their dining room table or countertop. It's kind of been interesting to see that. Certainly, dips on the on the back of a chair, right on the two chairs put together work pretty well. It's a pretty good chest exercise. You can get your hands up on books and do bigger range of motion push-ups, things like that. So those body weight exercises are the first place we start for people that literally have nothing and we grab whatever odd implements we can that are heavy, right? Yeah, I have a guy who uh, he's got he's got one kettlebell now, but he didn't for the first week. And so he was using, uh, he was putting towels like around his table or closing the door in a towel and he was kind of rowing that way. Yep, yep. So. Just doing what you can, right? So then you get to the next step, which is really where you were when you first got put into the quarantine, and that is you had a kettlebell. And so you started to make videos for us that have been incredibly helpful. I've used them a ton with my clients. You went out on your deck, out on your concrete deck with your kettlebell, and you started to go through lots of different kettlebell movements to just do the things that we talked about, to work the most muscle mass through a big range of motion as best you could. 
And what are some of those movements that you're utilizing and that you feel like work better maybe than others? Yeah, it's funny because a lot of the stuff I thought I would never use again on a broad scale. Uh, I've you know, been in, I was in kettlebells before I really was into barbells and now it's all, all coming back really useful. So I like to still think about the, the basic movement patterns, but the kettlebell kind of, kettlebell is interesting because it crosses so many movement planes yep. that it doesn't always neatly fit. Like you can do a kettlebell goblet squat where you hold the thing cl- up close to your chest and just, you can weight load a squat that way. That kind of fits neatly into the squat pattern. But with a kettlebell, you can also do a kettlebell clean. A kettlebell clean is different than a barbell clean because it's not just like a close vertical line up and down. You're kind of swinging it out and then catching it back in. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a deadlift pattern. It's kind of a squat pattern. It's kind of a pulling pattern. Yeah. Uh, so I like the clean. And then once you learn the clean, you can go into the clean and press. So you can actually get a kettlebell. And if you have a heavy enough one or you do enough reps, it gets quite challenging. You can work the press pattern once you learn how to get it into the clean rack position. You press from there. So that really takes care of our overhead pressing movement. Um, you've also got the snatch, kettlebell snatch, which first you learn the high pull, and which is also gets you a little bit of upper body pulling. Uh, then you learn how to snatch. So you've got, you know, some more of that kind of leg and arm, upper body and lower body synergy going with the kettlebell snatch. Sure. Um, and even the basic swing, like if you can't, the hardest thing to make harder with all this is the deadlift, right? We can kind of yep. figure out a way to load squats, pushes, you know, the deadlift, it's like, how do you load a deadlift if all you got is 35 pounds? Yep. Well, you could do like a, a 20 second tempo. That's right. <laughs> kind of ridiculous. But you know what? Doing a set of 20 or 25 swings, which maybe, maybe you're not going to do on day one if you're deadlifting 225. But even if you're a stronger, uh, stronger person, doing a set of 20 or 30 swings, even with like a 16 or 24 kilo kettlebell, yeah, it's obviously not the increment of the loaded strength, but it's it's a pretty challenging movement for the similar to the basic deadlift pattern. So sure. I really like the swing for that. Yeah, and then I saw, was it yesterday or in the last couple of days, you were doing some kettlebell good mornings, yeah. which probably put significant more moment on your back than a kettlebell deadlift would, right? Because you could actually get the thing up closer to your neck or head in that area and then go down, and it's it's a pretty intense movement as well. Yeah, one of the things I found doing the tutorial, I was like, man, I'm just doing a few reps and I really feel my hamstrings. Yeah. Because I I did the tutorial before I had used them in a workout. Yeah. Um, so I was, you know, I was holding it to my chest and doing a good morning. And it's even even though obviously you can load a barbell heavier, the fact that it's in the kind of front loaded, and you're having to hold it close to you, yeah, that's that. another little bit of challenge that the upper body has to work a little harder. And then you lean over and get that moment arm between the bell and your hips and you're like, gosh, you know, my hamstrings are really being pretty seriously loaded there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty good movement. Um, so the other thing that I've done with my clients who didn't have any equipment, the first thing I had them get was I had them get a kettlebell or a couple kettlebells. And, and the other thing I actually really like is, is some of those bands that originally were called jump stretch bands, but rogue and everybody makes them now, like all the, all the equipment manufacturers make their own bands and, and you can add quite a bit of resistance that way as well. So you take a, a mini, what we call a mini band, which is the one that's maybe a little wider than a half inch. And you can put it around your thumbs and behind your back and you can do push-ups with the thing. It works pretty well to kind of load push-ups. You can do the, one of the thicker bands work pretty well to also do banded good mornings. And, and it's not that hard to actually just put the band around the back of your neck, especially if you put kind of a towel around the back of your neck. So the, the rubber band doesn't pull on your skin and then still hold the kettlebell and just put the band underneath your feet. Because I'm sure it looks incredibly goofy if you're standing out on the back deck but you're talking about that's a pretty that's a pretty hard good morning to do with both the band around your neck and the kettlebell sort of cradled up against your chest and so there are a lot of movements that you can do with those bands and certainly there's tons of stuff you can do with the shoulders and internal rotation external rotation lateral raises you can do rows you can do tricep push downs you can stand on it and do banded curls all of those things work pretty well i've had people you know take the thin one and step on one foot and do lateral raises yeah uh tricep overhead stuff yep. Uh, one of the things I want to clarify, though, I've ran, I ran into this, so I, I quickly learned I had to clarify this, is the bands that you're talking about are this like single loop. It's like an ovular single loop. It's like a band. giant rubber band. It's literally like a giant rubber band. Because I, I had some clients tell me, oh, I got some bands, and I was yeah. giving them this kind of stuff, and what they meant was single tube with handles at the end. That's right. Which is a different set of logistics that you can do different things with. Sure. And then there's actually the bands that are probably my favorite. 
again, I, I can make a case for any of them being more useful than the other, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, the ones that I like are the ones where you can uh, either put it in a door jam or loop it, or, you know, loop it and tie it to a post. Yep. And then it has two separate handles with, on two separate leads yep. that you can kind of control independently. So I've been starting to do stuff like uh, chest presses, rotations, uh, banded, because you can you can load those in a horizontal vector. That's right. Tie it to something that's like waist height. And then I can kind of, it's kind of like a cable row. Yep. So I've been able to do some rows with those. So those are three different types of bands you can get. And depending which type you have, you can do all sorts of different things with. That's right. So then I've got some clients that have some TRX straps or some gymnast ring straps that will attach often to like a doorpost or the top of a door or a pole. And there's a lot of stuff you can do there as well um, with body weight movements. Basic curls, basic triceps, rows and rows and push-ups off of them. That's exactly right. Um, and you can do some extra, you know, we hate to say the word core, but you can do some extra core work. You can kind of do uh, walkouts or lean outs where you kind of mimic, yep. uh, you know, the barbell or wheel roll out. That's exactly right. If, if you're if you're gymnasty enough and light enough, you might, you know, you might be able to do uh, ring dips or you're probably not going to have something to attach it on to try it to try your muscle ups, but that's right. um, something like something like ring, ring dips might be possible depending on where you can hang them. Yeah, that's right. I had a client that did those just the other day. Um, so those are all really good options for people who don't have don't have much, and you can probably procure some of that stuff relatively quickly and relatively cheaply, right? I know that the next investment you made, next purchase you made, was with loadable dumbbells. You got you got dumbbell handles that were loadable so that you could incrementally load those. And I think those are incredibly versatile for training at home. Yeah, I, I had a, a bunch of clients get the kind of their fixed ones where they come with, it goes up to 50 or 70 pounds and you kind of click something in. Yep. I got ones that you can plate load. And I got the, the specifically got the ones with longer handles so I could load more weight on. Now I'm still waiting for some more plates to come. So I'm currently limited in how much weight I can use, but they're super versatile uh, because they're designed to not only be able to load a bunch of weight on, but also they spin. So if you want to do something like dumbbell cleans and snatches, you can, with the individual handles, you can do that. Or you can just use them for traditional stuff like curls and presses. And I've been starting to use them for floor presses. Yeah, um, I've done them with kettlebells and I did a tutorial that's up on the YouTube channel with kettlebells, but I like the dumbbell better for floor presses. Yep. Kind of doesn't, doesn't sit and bang on your wrist. Did you get some good... Uh, clips for them some to make sure you hold the weight on this. The only thing that I found is a lot of times people will spend some money on a nice loadable dumbbell set and then they have the old spring collars or yeah. or even, I mean, you've got to get a really good set of collars that are going to hold the weight on, especially if you're going to be going through a big range of motion with them. Yeah, you definitely don't want to rely on spring collars or or a cheap closer, like the knockoff. Yep. At the very least, get the, the good version of the one that kind of like locks closed. Yeah, the HGs. I, I actually happen to already have a set of, uh, what are they called, lock jaws. Yep. That was super useful. So those don't budge at all. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. yeah I've got the aluminum. It's the new, you know, Rogue bought the, uh, the company Oso that's got those, that had the, the clip that folds down. And I, I liked those. I mean, they, they won't move at all. They'll tend to take your finger off. They're almost like a mouse trap if you're not careful when you un, undo those things. But when the, the aluminum ones that Rogue bought Oso that made some changes to the design, and now they've got some really light aluminum, they're not cheap. They're like 50 bucks for a pair, and I've got a couple pair of those. They don't move at all. Um, but you start getting, just like we talked about, I mean, it starts getting relatively expensive pretty quick if you're not careful. And so figuring out what to do with what you've got is ex extremely important. Yeah, so that's actually a good topic to talk about. Like, what if you if you're on a you know a budget like most people are, especially now, you know if if you still have a job, you're worried about it. Um, you know, what do you want to get if you're on a budget? And it's really going to depend on how how strong you are, right? Yep. So if you're if you're pretty new to this and you're not that strong, and I probably say just get like a twelve and a twenty kilo kettlebell. Yep. Um, you know that that'll probably cost you you know with shipping maybe you know two hundred dollars or less. And you can do a lot with it. The reason I say two specifically, it's very hard to tell somebody to just buy one kettlebell, even though that's what the, when at least when I was learning about it 15 years ago, that's what the kettlebell people, I'll just start with one kettle. And it's like, but if we're trying to train our whole body, you get a kettlebell that's appropriate for your pressing, it's going to be too easy to swing. That's right. You'll have no challenge. If you yep. get one that's challenging enough to swing, you won't be able to press it. That's right. Yep. Uh, so 
I like to try to advise people to get two. You know, if you're newer, you'll probably get a 12 and a 20. If you're a little strong, or maybe you'll get a 16 and a 24. And if you're real strong, maybe you'll get a 20 and a 32. Yep. Like if I could have started with a 20 and a 32, I would have been a little happier than my 16 and 24. Sure. Uh, so that's kind of a good place to start for, you know, 150 to $250. Yeah. And if you're, if you've literally been laid off work and you don't have, I mean, you have almost no money. I think the cheapest thing you can do is go up to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy a couple of 50 pound sandbags, which costs nothing, literally cost a few dollars and bring them home and stick them in a duffel bag, duct tape them together, put them in the duffel bag. And as long as you've got a decently heavy duty duffel bag, which most people have in a closet somewhere, then you've got a pretty good implement to press, to squat, to swing, and you can you can mimic a lot of those movements, and it's pretty easy to get a 100-pound one. You could almost make like a 50-pound version and a 100-pound version and get a lot of work out of that as well, and you're talking about for less than 20 bucks. And so for those of you listening to the podcast right now, you're like, man, I've been laid off and don't know when my next paycheck is coming. I can't afford $200 to even go get a couple kettlebells. Like, we got, I got gotcha. you. I understand. I've been there before. Right then, you certainly can can make sh- do some things with some other makeshift objects like sandbags or again heavy bags of, or heavy heavy rocks um, or dog food bags things that you already have around the house. You'd be surprised at what you have that's relatively heavy. Yeah, and the other thing about that is for for those who aren't in super urban environments, all the stuff we've been talking about with the kettlebells, the dumbbells, and also with the really cheap stuff that you can get like a sandbag. If you've got a backyard or if you're you know a little l- suburban or or uh, or rural, you can do all kinds of carries, farmer carries, right. over the shoulder carries, front loaded carries, fireman carry. Like if you get a hundred pound sandbag shoulder carry, you know, a hundred feet in each direction, you're getting a decent, you know, a, a strength and conditioning effect from stuff like that. And you do, you know, you do five of those passes and then you do 20 kettlebell swings and then walk into one of those and then you do some squats and like you're going to burn out in like 20 minutes. Sure. Yeah, I always liked uh, – you can turn that into a competitive thing even even if it's just you, right, too. You can time the, time yourself. So I, w- I used to love taking a just a handful of odd implements. This is when I first started training strongman, and I didn't have any strongman equipment. I would just – you know, I had a big rock, and I had some sandbags, and I had some – you know, it's like whatever. And I would set up a an, – an, an, a spot to finish, like maybe it was a, a, a big countertop or a table, or maybe it was just to throw it over a pole or something. And you'd set your timer and here we go, three, two, one, go. And you'd pick up one object and you run it down and, you know, put it on the table. You run back, you get the next one, you do it again and you take, keep your time. And the next time you do it, you got to beat yourself. That's the, that's the, that's the deal. And so it brings in a lot of that conditioning aspect. And I think, I just think it's a lot of fun. And at the same time, we know it's slowing down the detraining effect that you would be you would be deep into if all you were doing right now is sitting at home eating junk food, ordering DoorDash and Uber Eats and, and watching Netflix, you know. So I, I think we have a responsibility to continue to do this. And for those of you that are listening, I, I would assume the vast majority of people that are listening to this podcast train because the podcast is called Barbell Logic. So you know it's about training. But if <laughs> if if you have you most of us have put in a lot of time and, and for some of us years and for some of us decades in training and what a waste to sit at home and do nothing right and so honestly for people like you and people like me who have spent most of our life focusing on getting really really strong maybe even at the expense of some of the other physical attributes it can be a nice change of pace to train the other physical attributes for a change and what i've noticed in the past with both myself and my clients is that when you come back from times like this if you've actually continued to train or exercise or whatever you want to call it, but with some consistency, you'll come back to the gym and yes, you'll be weaker, but you won't be weaker very long. And often you'll come back and listen, most people are going to go back to the gym in another month or two months or however long it's going to take. And we're all going to start LP again, right? Because that's what people are going to, because like people haven't trained. And I think what people people are going to find out is that the ones who continued to train while they were home or exercise and do the best they could with some consistency I bet many of those people will come back and set PRs, all-time PRs, in LP, three sets of five sort of PRs, things they've never hit before in their life. And the ones who didn't and just let themselves get really out of shape won't set PRs. They'll get stronger again. They'll come back and they'll get stronger. They'll get back to 90%. That's right. And then to switch it up again. That's right. And the other people, I think, you know, a good percent of them will set PRs. And that's actually a really good point. I don't know what percent of our, our listenership is kind of the more advanced lifters who have really focused on strength at the 
you know, certainly to the to the specialization degree and sometimes to the expense of other things. But what this has done for me, I've I've been lifting for 20 years, but I would say it's probably only been the last 10 or 12 that I've really specialized and focused on strength. Uh, it used to be I was, I would say, you know, at certain point I was reasonably strong and more balanced and I've let that slip to focus more on strength in the last 10 years. And I've actually found I'm enjoying getting back to that, you know, little more conditioned, not just in a single mode, you know, do some sprints on the bike, but, you know, do some kettlebell circuits. And I'm like, you know, this might be something that I, I come back to doing once a week, even after this is all over, because I'm actually finding that I'm enjoying doing that stuff again. Yeah, I, I, I thought about this too yesterday. I was thinking as I was programming for clients, I wonder how much of this stuff will keep, you know, these, some of these body weight movements, there's so many people doing push-ups and um, chins, which we do pretty much anyway, but dips and kettlebell swings and things like that. Like how much of that will we keep? And I think some of it is, I, I obviously, I want to be very careful and choose my words carefully. It, I don't know that you're healthier, but I bet you feel healthier. You know, I bet your range of motion, I bet your joints feel pretty good. I bet your range of motion in your shoulders feels good. I bet your, you know, your, your resting uh, heart rate is lower. I bet your blood pressure is down a little bit. So some of those markers that certainly people would attribute to being, quote unquote, healthier, I think it, it helps with those things. And so, you know, and then the crazy thing is it doesn't take very much time. So as you go back here in another few weeks or a few months back to the gym and start training heavy again, how much of that time is it going to take to add some of that stuff just in at the end of your workout 10 or 15 minutes 10 or 15 minutes twice a week yeah that's not very much for a pretty good benefit and again i every time i train this way i always come back like man i feel good when i do this i just feel better you know like i just feel like my my again i don't know if it's my cardiovascular system is actually healthier it's just my energy systems are more efficient right i'm not sucking wind as hard right? I feel like my blood pressure is a little lower. I feel like my heart rate, I know my heart rate is a little lower, like all of those things. And it just seems like I feel better. And I think to myself, why can't I just go in the gym and train heavy and then do this stuff for 10 or 15 minutes? And the answer is I can, you can do that stuff. Yeah, I agree. Even without, without trying to get outside of our expertise into the, into the medical stuff, I think even if it, even if all we stipulate is I kind of just feel better when I do this for 15 minutes, right? You know, once or twice a week, how much, how much higher quality of life do you have when you feel better? That's right. How much more motivated are you to train when you generally feel better? How much more motivated are you to like go for that PR that maybe you would have kind of just because you generally feel better? You know what? I feel good today. I'm going to go for it. Right. So I think even if it's all, even if it's just the psychological aspect of it, we could make a pretty good case for it. That's right. And I think maybe it's the most important piece of that, right? Like we know we probably can't prove that doing push-ups and dips and body weight movements are going to make your bench press go up. Not, not from a physiological standpoint, but from a psychological and sort of feels standpoint, it, it matters. And I think the strength community in general has sort of shit on that stuff for years as saying like, listen, like that doesn't, that doesn't really matter. And the reality is, is as we've done this, you and I both, I mean, we've been strength training for decades and we've both been, and we've been coaching for decades at this point. And to look back and say, you know, I've noticed that when my clients enjoy what they're doing, feel healthy, feel good, don't feel beat up, right? Their training is better. Their strength training is better. And I think you're right. I think that, um, you know, that, that emotional, psychological thing that happens with training this way can be very beneficial. And so, you know, that certainly there are two ways, of, you know, you've got the old adage of, you know, is the glass half full or is it half empty? I think if we attack this with, you know what, like I don't have heavy barbells and weights. And a lot of you guys don't out there. I do, by the way, I've got a sweet home gym. So this is, that's why I had to have you on the show. Cause I'm like, uh, I don't, you know, I've been programming for people, but I'm like, I'm, yeah, I can just go in there and train with my sweet bumper plates and my, and my, uh, and my ball bearing bars. And <laughs> but Listen, as much as we talk about how, how good this stuff might be, I still am jealous. I'd yeah, still sure. Of course. Of course. Uh, but you know what? At least I don't live in Manhattan anymore where I wouldn't have even had room to do what I'm doing. That's right. And you probably have COVID right now. So that's the other, that's the other thing. <laughs> if I there, yeah. <laughs> so you probably be dying of, uh, you know, tuberculosis like symptoms. So, uh, yeah, man, I, I, I think there's a way to look at it. And that glass half full is, you know, I don't have the things I really want to train with right now, but I, I can still do a lot of these things. I can feel really good about, about myself. I can feel better. I, and I, I'll bet it carries over to other things too, right? Going in and, and just saying like, look, you don't have anybody right now 
breathing. You don't really anyway, because you live a life of freedom, but mo you don't have anybody breathing down your neck being like, you know, Michael Wolf, you got to be at work at this time. You got to be at the gym at this time. You got to do this at this time. And my guess is, is that the discipline in, in, in being consistent with exercise will carry over to a lot of other things in your life as well, to your online coaching, to your, to your creating content and putting it out there on the internet to, you know, just uh, to reading, to making yourself better, probably to taking showers and putting real clothes on and brushing your hair and stuff. Even when you know that the only person that's going to see you is chops. And so, and so I would imagine there's some carryover there. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He's literally your best friend because he's the, he's the only human you've seen in a while. Chops the dog. Right. And he, he listens patiently to all my rants. That's right. And he's always excited no matter what, like he, when he sees you, he's always, that's the best thing about a dog, right? Like you're, you just, you know, you can leave your dog locked at home for two straight weeks, which you shouldn't do. But if you show up, there he is. They're excited. See, I have a gate in my, I've got to keep a gate in front of my office because my, uh, my little boxer likes to, or my boss and Terry likes to come in here and, and mark your territory. She's like, listen, I know you think it's your office, but I want to make sure you understand that it's mine. Huh? It and they don't ever do that. I don't pee anywhere else, but in my office, because she wants to know she's, she wants me to know it's hers, it's her office. So, so I got to put a gate on my front. So one, one point no, you made that really resonated with me. So I just want to bring, bring it just for a moment. You talked about how, you know, a lot of people in the strength, industry have kind of shit on this stuff. And I will, to some extent, admit to even being one of those people. Now, I don't think I really truly shit on it, but there's a, I think there's an extent to where we, we've got so caught up in trying to convince people to do what we consider to be real strength training. Because there's a lot of people out there who would say under ideal conditions, you just need push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups or whatever. And we do need to educate against that because That's that right. really isn't true. But I think sometimes we get so carried away in trying to get people to do what is best or what is better that we uh, lose sight of how maybe some of that other stuff can to, to in a certain context, not as the only thing or the main thing, but in a certain limited context can still be good. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, I think I've been as guilty of that as, as, as others. So sure. this and has been a good, a good reminder for me. Yeah, cer certainly me as well. I know in my early, in my early days, I was, I was much more kind of drew the line in the sand and said, this is what you do and this is what you don't do. And it's crazy as I, as I've, as I've become older and may, hopefully a little more wise and, uh, and also a little more beat up from all the years of actual competitive strength training for myself and, and training hundreds and thousands of coaches or hundreds of thousands of, of clients. I realize that there is benefit to some of this stuff. And so um, but you're exactly right. You cannot get strong without barbells and weights. Like that's how you get strong. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the stuff is worthless and that there isn't some, some piece of this that can make you feel better and, and you can enjoy. And that's the other thing. I've, I've said this before on the podcast. I'm not in the business of crushing dreams, man. If people want to people go jog five miles and they love it they love jogging five miles like man let them go jog five miles it's fine like it's is it going to compete some with the strength training yes it is right but for some people for most people the reason that we're doing this especially once you're out of your 20s and maybe early 30s and you're not you're not records chasing anymore like why are we strength training in the first place except for quality of life improvement i mean isn't that the primary reason we do the thing like sure we all want to look better and we all want to be jacked and we all want to be strong and all those things. But ultimately, even all of those things are really contributing to quality of life improvement. And so if we can let people do some stuff that makes them feel better so that their, their quality of life improves, let's do it. Let's not throw out the barbells and the, like, I can tell you this, when the gyms open back up, Barbell Logic Online Coaching is an online coaching business that utilizes barbells. It's in the name of the business. But it doesn't mean that we aren't going to do the other things. Um, so when the gyms open back up, we'll get back to squatting, we'll get back to deadlifting. But I hope there's some lessons learned here on some of the things that we can do to sort of branch out and feel a little better and have a little better range of motion and a little more health and, and cardiovascular fitness for sure. Yeah, there's, there's a great quote I remember reading from uh, last year. I read Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, which is like an award-winning sci-fi novel from like the 60s. Um, and he had a line in there where he said, only the extremes are logical, but the problem is they are absurd. That's right. That's right. So it's kind of like that, you know, we have to, we have to have stand on our principle that you need barbells and weights and a bench and a rack to get strong, but 
standing on that that's the only thing that anybody in the world should ever do that's right uh, puts you in an, a slightly absurd place that's exactly right yep agreed yeah and you don't take it so far to the other side where you say well just do whatever feels good all the time uh, or you know if you want to get strong just as long it doesn't matter you know how you lift or what your programming looks like or what the form is like we all of those things matter and we, we've staked our careers on those things um, but it's not the only thing that matters, right? And, and it goes far beyond the weight room as well. We've talked about this before. Like certainly, I'm sure you know there are people in your life, including your including chops, who are probably more important to you than your back squat, and for me too, right? And um, and so there are things in life that matter more than just strength training. Strength training is extremely important to us. We love the voluntary hardship aspect of it. And that's a lot of what this is too with the training at home. Like that you are you are choosing to do a thing that's voluntarily hard. When you don't have the thing you're used to, like you don't have the barbells and the weights. And so I think a lot of people who are our listeners and our fans will walk around kind of with their chest puffed up like, yeah, I do voluntary hardship. I back squat and deadlift all this weight. And that is super impressive and, and it's something to be commended. But when it's not there, do you still choose voluntary hardship? Yeah, it's almost a test of it's a, it's a you know psychological voluntary hardship to make yourself use a 20 kilo kettlebell in your own body weight. And that's all you got to still find a way to get to get out of breath. You're not used to getting out of breath to still find a way to get a good workout in with something you're not used to is a, it's a different type. That's right. That's right. Love it, dude. Well, hope the training keeps going well. Uh, I'm excited to see what more, you know, as depending on how long this lasts and hopefully it lasts not very much longer, but if it does, I'm interested to see what you come up with because I know as time goes on, you're going to adapt to the movements that you're doing right now out on the back deck with the kettlebells and stuff. It'll be interesting to see what you start to go like, okay, I can tweak this a little bit. I can do this a little bit and make these changes to con to continue to increase the stress, which is really still the goal, right? And by the way, I, I meant to say this. I, I was thinking before I even interviewed you on this was that you're seeing a ton of stuff right now online on, on social media, especially about you know, these, these, these home workouts, which are great. I'm super glad everybody's doing that stuff. And it's great to have access. But if if we're picking home workouts, like it's a CrossFit workout in a hopper, right? Oh, what what home workout am I doing today? That's that's not training. And I think we would argue that while training isn't optimal in, in the position that you're in right now and the equipment that you have, you can still train. You don't have to exercise. And the thing that makes it different for us and, and different for you is that we are still systematically adding more stress every single workout. And while we can't systematically add more intensity every workout necessarily right now, because not everybody has access to that incrementally loadable weights, you can do more reps, you can do more volume, you can train more often with more frequency, you can train, you can get more work done in a period of time, you can slow things down and do tempo like you talked about. Like There are lots of options to continue to incrementally and progressively increase the stress. Absolutely. That is probably something we should have led with that. We're, we're still trying to make this training to the largest extent we possibly can. That's right. Um, understanding that there are limitations. We're still trying to make this training and not just random exercise. And we're still trying to have a systematic logical approach to progressions, whether they be a difficulty progression, a volume progression, a density progression. That's what we're still trying to do. And what you've noticed when I've been posting, like I've been posting just single lift tutorials and I will continue to do that until I get as many out as I think aren't necessary. But what I'm going to start to do after that is combinations. Like yep. instead of just here's a kettlebell snatch, like, okay, here is a swing into high pull into snatch into windmill. Yep. So if you've already kind of exhausted yourself on that, try this combo Yep, um, and things like that. Yeah. We like, uh, we've, I've been doing a lot of like 30 seconds on 30 seconds off or 20 seconds on 20 seconds off and going through a, a basic, maybe like a three movement circuit. So 20 second kettlebell swing, you know, 20 second kettlebell press, 20 second lunges, uh, and then a lot, of, you know, and then maybe I'll even do like a sit up or something core and then go through it and 20 seconds rest and go through a round again. And so just trying to figure out some of working some of the antagonist muscles and, and things are, are sort of fun to, to play around with. And so I, there's lots of way, lots of places to go. Yeah, I didn't know how granular you wanted to get on this, but that's I, I love for, for our population of strength focused, but not not only uh, kind of target workouts. Um, I love the like the two to three move circuit. Me too. I think it's perfect. It's yep. it's it's low enough on the like your heart rate won't get crazy high for so long that you can't use any kind of resistance and you're just doing cardio. But it's enough of a heart rate challenge that it it just in terms of like perceived general difficulty makes up somewhat for the lighter weight that you're forced to That's use. That's right. That's right. Yep. That's good. So I you know I don't want, I don't get into these eight move circuits where you're just no. heart rate elevated for eight minutes at a time because we're We've moved too far away from 
strength training, which is what we're trying to do. That's right. Um, but you know, you just do one thing at a time with a limited weight. You're kind of just not working hard enough right. on a very vague general level. Right. Yep. Agreed. I love the, the two to three move circuit, I think is a great sweet spot for most people. Agreed. And, and then you can also, even in, in that, you can then rest three to five, six minutes and then do a different two to three movement circuit. Right, which works really good. Get nice full body work. Are you doing mostly full body workouts right now? Or are you splitting it up between upper and lower? Uh, I'm not splitting at all. I'm doing all full body. That's kind of what I figured. And how many Especially days? Especially with the kettlebell as a main tool, that tends to be like the way you kind of have to do it. Right. Because everything, kind of, you know, anytime I press, I have to clean first. Yep. You know, where do you categorize a snatch? Is that upper or lower? Well, yeah, it's, it's full. Mostly lower, but there. I mean, if you do, if you do three sets of twelve snatches with a twenty-four kilo kettlebell, right. you haven't done those in a while. You feel your upper body like immediately. Sure. So it's hard to categorize it. I, I've been doing full body workouts. And uh, another another way I've been playing around with it is adjusting the rest period like for a three move circuit. If you're in great shape, you can go boom from one to the next. Yep. You could do a 20 second rest between each movement and a two minute rest or three minute rest between the whole thing. So between the round. You can yeah. also, you know, it's still a circuit, but you have little rest between each movement and big rest between the whole yep. set. So yep. there's, there's lots of different ways that you can play with that. Awesome. Are you training three days a week, four days a week? How, how often are you going every other day? So I've been, it's been sporadic for me only because I've been finding that when I film tutorials, um, I do better doing like 10 or 15 at once instead of like one or two per day. So then you're think, smoked. Oh, I'm going to film tutorials <laughs> and train, and then I only have film. Just so I don't know if I should count that as training. Oh, right, right, right. I get but it. I'm basically going for four days a week. Okay, got um, it. So it's like every other day plus one. Yeah, uh, is kind of how I've been going for it. So doing four days a week, so uh, of total body. Yeah, makes sense. Well, thanks for being on the show, man. I hope you you guys got some uh, good practical takeaways. Uh, we'll get away a little bit from the uh, depressing uh, stress talk and actually get into the practicals of what we can actually do. And so uh, let us know what you're doing. If you've come up with other great ideas of things that you're using for weights or movements around the house, for those of you who don't have all the equipment that you need, please send us an email, uh, questions at barbell-logic.com. And in the subject line, put put train at home. And uh, we'll read those on the air and give good examples of how to train at home. So, dude, thanks for being on the show. How do people find you? What's, is Instagram the best spot? Uh, Instagram is probably the best spot right now. It's at wolf underscore strength. There you go. But I did just, I started this YouTube channel because of this. Um, I had, you know, it's, I had a, a bunch of videos from like 2013 to 2015 up on my personal YouTube. And then I actually just on accident got like 600 subscribers from that. So I thought about continuing it on that one, but it's my personal yeah. one. So I just didn't want to mix it. So the YouTube channel is wolf strength, two separate words, no dot or underscore where all these 30 tutorials are up. So you can, you can subscribe and so you got 30 videos. of them up there now. Yeah. I don't know if I could name it. Like, you know, if we were playing like a, like if it was a board game at home, like categories or something, and you had to come up with 30 kettlebell movements. I don't know if I could write down 30 kettlebell movements. <laughs> I know when I'm programming for my clients, I type for those of you guys that don't know, like when you're, when you're programming on in true coach, the software we use, I just type kettlebell. And then I see all your stuff come up, and I'm like, ooh, this one. <laughs> and I'm like, this is great. And then I watch the video. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. So, yeah, so for some great kettlebell movements, uh, to learn how to do those basic movements at home, uh, check Wolf out. What is the YouTube channel name? Is it also, also Wolf Strength? It's Wolf Strength, two words, no hyphen or underscore or anything. And there are dumbbell and a few body weight up there now, so it's like 22 kettlebells. Perfect. And I'll be adding as we go. So by the time you look at this, there may be more. But the YouTube channel is Wolf Strength, and the Instagram, those are the two best places. Uh, Instagram is at Wolf underscore strength, because some bastard already had Wolf Strength. <laughs> we will uh, we'll link both those in the show notes uh, today for sure. So you guys, get to training out there. Do what you can. Don't just exercise. Don't just pick those exercise programs out of the hopper or pull them off off of instagram or social media actually think about what you're doing and making sh making sure that you're adding stress every single workout be a a group of action people of action and get out there and actually do it uh, you'll be surprised at how much better your training will go when you get back into the gym and you add the squats and the deadlifts back in so thanks for being on the show man we will talk soon if you guys love what we're doing please give us a five-star review on itunes or any of your favorite podcast uh hosts what do you listen to you listen to podcasts on what what app do you use when you listen to podcasts I, I use the the apple you do i'm an overcast guy 
I don't. I just. I don't. I like Overcast. And what they do is when there's dead, just automatically when there's when there's dead dead silences, like just even like one second of silence, it sort of automatically cuts that out. So the flow is better. I, you know what? I haven't been super thrilled with it. So what is it called? Overcast. I may Overcast. Try I, lo- I love it. I love Overcast. I I can't. I'm not a big fan of the uh, of the iTunes actual like podcaster uh, app, but they're the ones that create the ranking. So uh, go in and say nice things about us if you can. And we will see you in a few days. Thanks for listening.